So in this case, we have a 12 lead ECG that was acquired by the paramedics for a 57 year old male who had the chief complaint of chest pain. Now, as is the case with all um, 12 lead ECG acquisitions, uh, when we have a chief complaint associated with it, we're kind of prone to looking for what could be causing that chief complaint. And in the setting of somebody who's experiencing chest pain, uh, AMI is pretty high on our differential um, amongst some other things. But in order to not miss anything, we're gonna approach this 12 lead uh, in a stepwise manner and just kind of go through each of the various steps to ensure that we're not missing anything. So first and foremost, we're gonna get an idea of what the rate is. Because this ECG is done through a, like a light pack, it will calculate the rate for you. But if we take an R wave and an R wave and count out the boxes in between, so that's like 3.5-ish boxes, uh, we can do our 300 divided by 3.5, and that'll give us something in the range of uh, 85 beats per minute, which means that this is in fact pretty accurate. From there, let's look at what the cardiac axis is doing, and we're gonna do that by evaluating lead one and lead ABF. Uh, lead one's orientation is predominantly electropositive, whereas lead ABF's orientation is predominantly electronegative, and so we have a left axis deviation. Finally, uh, we're gonna take a peek at what our intervals are doing. Uh, it looks like we do in fact have P waves. They're preceding all of the QRS complexes, which do appear to be narrow. And then there's also a T wave present. Uh, the rhythm itself is regular. We don't have a whole lot of variance um, and it is a sinus rhythm. Now, because we have the complaint of chest pain, we're gonna wanna scrutinize this 12 lead, uh, looking for signs of ischemia. And those are gonna be predominantly ST depression and ST elevation. Now, I'm sure you guys uh, have all kind of gotten a chance to look at this and have probably honed in on what's going on in these precordial leads as far as ST changes are concerned. And so when we look at leads V1, V2, V3, we can pretty clearly see that the ST segments are elevated. And if we zoom in on these leads more closely, we can see that the J point is located right here. And that if we compare that to the isoelectric baseline, at least in V2, um, there's about uh, two millimeters of elevation. And if you'll recall the criteria for uh, a STEMI in the setting of somebody who's over the age of 40 is uh, two or more millimeters of ST elevation in two contiguous leads. Now we know that V2 has got uh, two millimeters of ST elevation. It's pretty darn obvious. Additionally, you can see that there are some hyperacute T waves and that the QRS complex could very easily fit inside this large T wave. But let's move down to lead V3 and see if there is some ST elevation here as well. And we do in fact see that. Um, there is one box, two box, um, so two millimeters, and it is in a contiguous lead because remember, for the most part, V1, V2, and V3 are contiguous with one another. Uh, V1 and V2 are more of your septal leads. And V3 is when you get into your anterior leads, but they would be considered to be contiguous. Now that we've confirmed that we have ST elevation and two or more contiguous leads, it's time to look for the presence of reciprocal changes. And if we think about what's gonna be reciprocal to the septal anterior wall of the myocardium, that's gonna be uh, like the lateral aspect and the inferior aspect of the heart. And so if we take a peek at our lateral leads, for instance, uh, those being leads one and ABL uh, and V6, we can in fact see that there is a little bit of ST depression. Um, if we measure this uh, T to P segment and use that isoelectric line, we can very clearly see that there's about uh, one millimeter of ST depression here. And then if we use the PR interval here um, as our isoelectric line, we can see that there's about like, you know, 0.5 to one millimeter ST depression. If we look in lead AVL, AVL in this case is not very helpful, um, but maybe it's the ST segments are sagging a little bit. Um, if we move over to lead three and lead AVF, we can see that there are some inverted T waves present, um, which are in suggestive of a reciprocal change as well. And then there's a, a hint of ST depression out here in AVF, even though it's not quite a millimeter. So based off of the history of present illness, based off of the uh, 12 lead findings and the fact that we do have two or more contiguous leads with uh, 
greater than two millimeters of ST elevation. Uh, this would fulfill STEMI criteria. As an aside, which I think is pretty interesting, uh, this case also is a good example of something called a loss of precordial T wave balance. And what that means is, is that the T wave in lead V1 has a higher amplitude than the T wave in V6. And that has been shown to also strongly be associated with uh, myocardial infarction. And in some cases, you may only get that loss of precordial T wave balance as your first sign before these ST segments start to rise. And as we all know, um, AMIs are a very dynamic disease process. And so when in doubt, get serial 12 leads and also just, you know, listen to what your patient's telling you and what your patient's showing you. If they've got a history suspect of ACS um, and they've got pain that radiates, diaphoresis and nausea, you should take that pretty seriously.